Number 7. In June 2006, 38-year-old Truman Duncan from Cleborne, Texas, was working at his job on the railway. He was in the process of connecting two rail cars when he slipped and ended up falling under the wheels of a moving rail car, which effectively cut him in half. He lost part of his pelvis, his left leg, kidney and his right leg from below the thigh. When most people would have just passed out during this horrific accident, he managed to hang on to the train until it came to a stop and then ring 911 on his cell phone to alert the emergency services. I got ran over by the rail guards. I need 911. I think I'm dead and dirty. Okay. I need, I need to now. And someone got ran over by a rail car? It was me. And I'm about to pass out. It took them a further 45 minutes to arrive and remove him from under the train, during which time he remained conscious and even rang his family whilst waiting to be rescued. During this time, the father of three said that he never thought he was going to die. At the hospital, surgeons spent three and a half hours saving his life and removing dirt and debris from his wounds. He went on to have a further 23 operations over a four-month period before being released from hospital. He went on to make a remarkable recovery and although he is wheelchair bound, he returned to a desk job for the same railway company he worked for when he had the accident. Number six. Being a British soldier in Afghanistan is a dangerous occupation at the best of times, but for combat medic Lance Corporal Dean Bousfield, the 2nd of July 2010 would become a life-changing day. He was three months into a tour of duty when out on a routine patrol he was shot in the head by a sniper. The bullet went straight through his helmet and passed right through his brain before exiting his skull above the right ear and lodging in the helmet on the opposite side to which it entered. He was evacuated by a helicopter to a British camp bastion before being transferred to an American hospital where he was operated on by an American neurosurgeon. In 99.9% .9 of cases where this sort of trauma occurs to the brain, the outcome is invariably fatal but for Dean Bousfield he survived but was not expected to live and was sent back to England to die surrounded by his family. However he didn't die and his recovery has astounded doctors. The bullet destroyed a large part of his brain including the speech cortex. Doctors believe he would neither move nor talk but he's gone on to do both. Talking afterwards Dean said that all he could remember was firing his rifle and then waking up four weeks later in hospital. Although he suffered some paralysis, he has gone on to take part in a host of gruelling physical challenges, including the Help the Heroes Big Battlefield ride in 2014, where he hand-pedalled 335 miles from Brussels in Belgium to Paris in France. And in the same year, he also won a bronze medal for the seated shot put at the Invictus Games for wounded service personnel. Personnel. Number 5. Getting shot by one bullet can be fatal, but getting shot 16 times and still living to tell the tale is more like a miracle than a recovery. But that's what happened to Joseph Guzman as he was leaving a bachelor party in Queens, New York on November 25th, 2006. Guzman said that he was leaving the party with two friends. Trent Bennyfield and Sean Bell, who was actually the man who was getting married later that morning. The men doing the shooting were three plainclothes police detectives who were undercover at the party. They said they witnessed Sean Bell arguing outside the club with a driver of an SUV, and they overheard Guzman saying he was going to get his gun. The detectives followed the three men and confronted them as they headed to their car. It was when they got into the car and the driver, Sean Bell, bumped one of the detectives with his car as he tried to get away that the officers opened fire on the car. In all, they fired 50 bullets into the car, killing Bell and injuring Guzman and Bennyfield. When Guzman was admitted to hospital, the doctors counted 19 bullet holes caused by 16 bullets, seven of which were found in his body. He was shot in the legs, chest, face and had multiple wounds to his abdomen and intestines. Guzman went on to make a full recovery and the incident sparked fierce criticism of the police. The three officers were charged with manslaughter, but they were later acquitted on all charges. Number four. Phineas Gage is one of the earliest documented cases of a severe brain injury and in many ways kick-started modern neurology because of the ongoing study of the major personality changes that he suffered after the accident. Gage was the foreman of a railroad crew and on the 13th of September 1848 was excavating rocks to make way for a new railroad track. They did this by drilling holes into the rocks and then placing explosive powder into them. On that day he was compacting explosive powder into a hole in the rock with a tamping iron. A tamping iron is a large iron rod about four feet long and one and a quarter inches in diameter 
As he was packing the explosive down, a spark ignited the explosive in the hole and fired the tamping iron out at high speed and through Gage's head. It entered below his cheek and exited completely out of the top of his head before landing some 30 yards away. Though now blind in one eye and with a gaping hole in the top of his head, incredibly he was able to walk to an ox cart within minutes of the accident and was transported to the boarding house where he was staying to be treated by the local doctor. Having survived what many thought should have killed him outright, he became a bit of a celebrity especially in the medical circles. Although he seemed to have recovered as well as can be expected, those close to him said he was no longer the same man. He lost all his social inhibitions, he couldn't stick to plans, was often drunk, bad-tempered and as they say uttered the grossest profanities and showed little deference for his fellows. The damage to his frontal cortex caused by the tamping iron had effectively performed what we now know as a frontal lobotomy on him. This led to many advances in the study of the brain and what the effect of this sort of damage could have on the personality of the injured person. The railroad company that once called him a model employee refused to take him back. He drifted from one job to another before ending up with relatives in San Francisco where he died in 1860 after a a series of seizures at the age of 38. Number 3 Sometimes, even when you think you've had enough of life, a higher power may well choose that it's not your time to go and you have to carry on living. That's pretty much what happened to an unnamed Oregon man who tried to kill himself with a nail gun 12 times. The man was high on methamphetamines and in a suicidal state when he turned the nail gun on himself and fired two inch long nails into his own head. Doctors only found out what he'd done when he admitted himself to hospital complaining of a headache and saying that he'd had an accident with a nail gun, but later he admitted that it was a suicide attempt. Initially the nails couldn't be seen, but when they x-rayed him it revealed six nails clustered between his right eye and ear, two below his right ear and four on the left side of his head. Some of the nails were close to the brain stem and major blood vessels, but none pierced them. Surgeons removed the nails with pliers and a drill and the man survived with no lasting effects. According to a report written by Dr Alexander West, the neurosurgeon who oversaw the treatment, no one is known to have survived after deliberately firing so many foreign objects into the head. The man was transferred to a psychiatric centre under court order for a month before leaving against doctor's orders. Number two. In the previous story, we had a man trying to kill himself with a nail gun, but in this one, the man in question, Dante Atulo from Chicago, was building a garden shed and had no intention of trying to kill himself. So when the nail gun he was using misfired, he thought it had just grazed his head as the nail flew past. He carried on building the shed and even did some snow ploughing. It was only waking up the next day and feeling sick, but he decided to go to the hospital. When doctors x-rayed him, they found a three and a half inch long nail embedded in the center of his brain, just millimeters from his motor cortex, which if it had entered, would have killed him immediately. When he first saw the x-ray, he thought they were having a joke with him until the doctor said, no, that's what's in your head. He was rushed to another hospital for surgery to have it removed. Afterwards, Dante said it felt like he'd been punched in the side of a head, but thought the nail had just grazed his head as it flew past his ear. Although there are pain-sensitive nerves on the skull, there are none in the brain itself, which is why he only felt the pain of the nail going through his skull, but not the nail when it was actually in his brain. After the operation, he made a full recovery with no lasting effects and remembers everything that happened, even though it might be something he wishes he could forget. Number one. To round up this video, and still on a construction tool theme, California electrician Ron Hunt was working up a ladder drilling into an overhead surface on August 15th, 2003, when the ladder started to give way. He immediately threw down the drill, but as he fell off the ladder, he ended up falling face down onto the 18 inch long, one and a half inch diameter drill bit that went straight through his right eye socket and out the back of his head. All this time he was still conscious and felt no pain. He said he ran his hands up the drill to his eye and then put the other hand to the back of his head and felt it coming out the back of his skull. That's when he said he felt the shock set in. He was flown by helicopter to the Washoe Medical Center with the drill still lodged in his head. When his family arrived to see him in hospital and saw him with a huge drill through his head, he was actually laughing and joking with the staff. His nephew, Ben Hunt, said that it just didn't seem possible for him to be alive, let alone cracking jokes and telling tales. 
Ron escaped death because the drill didn't actually go through his brain. It just pushed it to one side as it went through his skull. The surgeons wondered how they might actually remove the drill from his skull, but in the end they twisted it and effectively unscrewed it out of his head. He lost his right eye and had titanium plates screwed into his skull, but was healthy enough within weeks to be interviewed by the news media. He subsequently returned to his job and he's getting on with his life. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then don't forget to please thumbs up and subscribe for more. And if you have any ideas for videos you'd like to see, then please let us know in the comments below.